Well, we started a new series in 1 Thessalonians a couple weeks ago. We're going to do our second part in that. We're in chapter 2. Um, the, the first part, we talked all about the, the faith of the people in Thessalonica, the faith of the Christians that were there. And uh, we talked about the importance of, of mentors, right? How it's important that in life we have people that we uh, look up to and who we go to who have more wisdom than we do that can help us. And so we said we're going to look at the faith of the, the Thessalonians and we're going to treat them like our mentors with faith. And we had some points uh, there and the, the title was called Exemplary Faith. Um, so if you missed that one, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Uh, but you can see the title for tonight is, is Exemplary Evangelism, right? In, in the same way that we can learn a lot about the, the faith uh, or faith from the Thessalonians, we're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul with these verses. And we know that Silas and Timothy were with him in this, this journey when he was in Thessalonica. And uh, there's a lot to learn about evangelism, right? Uh, things, to, to, things to be praying for, things to be uh, conscious about, things to make sure that we're avoiding in evangelism. And so uh, tonight is going to be different. You can see that your worksheet is blank. That is because I have 10 points for you tonight. 10 points. But we're going to do a speed run. We're going to go fast, all right, uh, so we can get you to small groups. But uh, pretty much every verse here in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going uh, verses 1 through 12, essentially every verse has a, a principle that we need to consider when it comes to evangelism. All right, so we're going to look now at the example that Paul and Silas and Timothy set in evangelism, and we're going to pray that we can implement this and follow this in our daily life when it comes to the evangelism that we are involved in, because we should all be involved in doing that, right? Whether it's campus evangelism or personal, all of it. We should be sharing the gospel with as many people as we possibly can. We need to be involved in this. And so we're going to look and see and learn from the Apostle Paul, all right? So look with me now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Here's what it says. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Verse 9, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you, believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Right, so like I said, lots of really great things to pull from the life of the Apostle Paul when we're thinking about our evangelism, how we're conducting ourselves when we go about and we're sharing the gospel with those people around us. What should we do? How should we live? What should we have in mind? What should we be praying about? Here we go. Point number one, we need to be praying for fruitful evangelistic opportunities. Pray for fruitful evangelistic opportunities. So you see, Paul tells the Thessalonians, he essentially says, you guys know that our coming to you was not in vain. And in other words, he's saying it wasn't a failure. That we came to Thessalonica, we proclaimed the gospel, people got saved, a church was planted, and it is a thriving church. This church is doing a really good job, right? We talked about last week from chapter 1 how Paul, he's going to other cities to proclaim the gospel, and when he gets there, he realizes that he doesn't need to do that because the Thessalonians beat him to it. 
So he's proclaiming the gospel. To, he, he had proclaimed the gospel to the Thessalonians, established a church. This church is going out, and they're sharing the gospel. And so he's meeting people, and they're like, yeah, we know the gospel because the Thessalonians shared it to us. And that's encouraging, right? He's encouraged by that. And so he goes there to Thessalonica, preaches the gospel, and it is this awesome, fruitful opportunity where, where God saves people and this church is planted, and that is an awesome thing. And when we think about Paul, Paul was certainly a skilled missionary, a skilled evangelist. He, he had skill, right? I'm just repeating myself now, but he knew what to do. He knew what to say, right? He was a powerful preacher. He was confident. He was bold. He had all these things, but Look, before we talk about methods and strategy and other things, we need to establish first that evangelism, it'll be completely fruitless if God is not involved. So if we're thinking that we can just depend on our skill, our method, if we read a book on evangelism, we say, oh, I'm going to do that. If we think, oh, I can talk to people, I have the personality to do this, I can do that, oh, then I'll be fine evangelizing. If, if we're relying on ourselves or our skills or some method that we read or heard from some seminar, it's not going to be fruitful because God is not really involved in that. If you're saying it's all about me and my skill and what I'm going to do, that's not the case. So we have to make sure that what we're doing, first of all, is we're praying for this. And I can just imagine that Paul, as he's on these missionary journeys, before he arrives to the places he's going to, he's praying for opportunity. He's asking God, God, allow this to be a fruitful trip. Or when we get to Thessalonica, when we get to Corinth, when we get to these places, God, please let people receive the message of the gospel. Let, let people get saved. Let us have a fruitful time there. And so before we can even think about actually having that conversation, we need to think, okay, we need to be praying for God to give us opportunities. And not just to give us opportunities, but to give us fruitful opportunities. We need to be praying and saying, God, please would you give me an opportunity to do this? And, and we're not relying on our rhetoric. We're relying on the power of God. And we see this reflected in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says, And, and I, when I came to you, talking to the, the, to the Christians in Corinth, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He's saying, look, it's not about me, and I'm not, it's not about my great skills of speaking and preaching and all this stuff, but I'm relying on the power of God and the Holy Spirit. I'm praying for fruitful opportunities, and God is the one who does the work, and it, and it takes us to be faithful to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to proclaim the gospel, but I'm going to trust the result to God. I'm going to entrust Him with that result. So I just want you to think, when is the last time that you prayed and you asked God to give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Well, last time you were praying, you are saying, God, it's been a while since I shared the gospel. Would you please bring someone in my life that I can share the gospel with? And God, would you please let this be fruitful? Let me make a, a connection with someone and build a relationship and be able to, over time, proclaim the gospel over and over and let this person eventually put their trust in you. Are we praying that? We should be praying these things. It needs to be a habit of ours. It should be on our prayer list. It should be on our minds all the time that we are praying and asking God to give us these opportunities and that they would be fruitful. And in verse 2, after he says we had fruitful ministry there, it was, we did not come to you in vain, he says, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So at this point, Paul had already been to Philippi. He had already been there. He had already proclaimed the gospel. People had gotten saved. A church started there. And it was not easy. It was not easy for him to do this. Paul and Silas, they were beaten publicly in Philippi for proclaiming the gospel. They were thrown into prison for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they got out of prison, what did they do? They kept preaching the gospel. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't go silent. They didn't run away. They didn't, they didn't back down from this. They were bold, and they said, it doesn't matter what happens to us. We're going to keep proclaiming the gospel. And now they've come to Thessalonica, and he's reflecting on his time there, and he's saying, just like in Philippi, we dealt with much conflict in your city. 
And we kept preaching the gospel. We kept proclaiming the gospel. We kept sharing the gospel. And so when it comes to our evangelism, when we are sharing the gospel, we need to, point number two, boldly endure ridicule. We need to be bold enough to say, I'm going to face whatever ridicule may come, whatever threats that I may hear, whatever people say, whatever nonsense they say about me, I'm going to face it with boldness and say, it doesn't matter what you say about me because I know that I have the most important message in the world, which is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to proclaim this to as many people as I can. And you can do whatever you want to me. You can say whatever you want about me. You can spread whatever rumors about me that you want. It doesn't matter to me because I care about you, because I love you, and I want you to put your trust in Jesus. That's the attitude that we should have. To be able to boldly endure endure ridicule. And it happened to Paul. It's happened to a million other people, and it will happen to you. That's what we have to understand. You think about where we're at, where culture is at, where we're at as a society. You guys are on the college campuses. You know how it is. If you open your mouth and you proclaim the gospel, at some point in time, you're going to face ridicule. And we have to be bold enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to back down because of that. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep sharing the gospel because I know what's at stake. Their soul is at stake. And they need to put their trust in Jesus. We need to stop caring so much about what people think about us. We need to stop saying, oh, they, they didn't like that. They didn't like that I said that, so I'm going I'm to stop. I don't want to be that person that's known as like the Jesus freak on campus. So we, we shouldn't care about that. We should care about people's souls. We need to be proclaiming the gospel and being bold. We need to be bold about this. We need to be praying for this. As we're praying for these opportunities, we should be praying, God, please let me be bold. Help me to have the boldness that Paul and Timothy and Silas and so many other people before, all these missionaries, you've heard so many stories, they had boldness to go to preach the gospel and to keep pushing through even these difficult circumstances. Verse 3, Paul says, For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. So he describes what they're doing in proclaiming the gospel as making an appeal. Making an appeal. So what that means is that they, there is a call to respond. That's what an appeal. I appeal to you. I'm urging for you to do something. He's saying, yeah, you have to do something with this information. This information, what, what, what it means is you need to repent of your sin. and You need to put your trust in Jesus. That's the appeal that we're making, right? We're not just saying, I'm going to list off a bunch of facts to you and say, this is the case, and then go do what you want with it. We need to make that appeal and say, you need to repent. You need to, this is what you need to do. This is what the gospel demands. It demands repentance and faith. But in doing that, Paul says, our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. And so this appeal that we make, it needs to be clear of any wrong motives. And so point number three is this, check your motives. And I know that it sounds counterintuitive on the surface level to think that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached from wrong motives, from bad motives, but this does happen. This is not a new thing. We see this in, the, in, in Paul's letter to Philippi. He said in chapter 1, verse 15, Some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So what was happening there is there were these people who were jealous of Paul. They were jealous of Paul's rising popularity. And let's just be clear, we'll get to this later, but Paul wasn't doing this to become popular. He wasn't doing this to get rich. He didn't do it for any of that reason. But as people were putting their trust in Jesus, they were wanting to know, well, who's the guy telling us about it? It's Paul. And so Paul was getting popular. He was getting this following, and people were getting jealous. And so they said, well, I want that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go say the same thing Paul says. And they're, they're going around. They're preaching the gospel. They're not doing it with a pure motive. They're doing it because they want fame and popularity, and that maybe these people are even pressing it further, and they're deceiving, and they're getting money out of it. They're doing stuff. Who knows? But that's what Paul is saying, is this appeal doesn't come from any bad motive. The motive is, I want people to put their trust in Christ. That's why I'm sharing the gospel. There's no deception here. There's nothing going on here. So look, I just, we just need to be clear. You need to check yourself for any wrong motive. When it comes to the evangelistic conversations that you're having, when you decide to share the gospel, the reason should be because you love the person, 
that you're sharing the gospel with. And you want to see them put their trust in Christ. There should be no selfish motivation at all. It's all because you love that person and you care for that person. So if it's not because of your great love for lost people, then it's probably not the right motive. Right, and this it connects well with the next point, which makes sense because it follows. It's, it's, it's connected to verse 3 and verse 4. He says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So yeah, check your motives. What's going on? Check the motives behind this evangelism. <clears throat> and you need to make sure that you're not doing this in order to please people. You need to make sure that the evangelism that you're doing, it's not being done to please any person other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to make sure that's what the motivation is, right? So you should not be doing this. Here's point number four. You've got you to aim to please God. That's the goal. You aim in your evangelism to please God. You're not doing it because you think it's going to make your pastor happy or your friends happy or your small group leaders happy. You're not doing it because you want to look good. You want to look like the Christian who has things figured out. And when people ask if you're evangelizing, you just want to say yes so that you can say you're doing the right thing, right? There's so many things. Like you don't want to just be evangelizing so that you can check the good works box and say, I'm doing the good thing. That's what I'm doing. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. It's not to please other people. It's not even to please yourself primarily. It's to please God. It's so that God gets the glory. We need to have that perspective, right? Because as people who trust in Christ, what God has done is he has entrusted us with something. Think about that. God of the universe. God. He has entrusted Christians with the message of the gospel. And he has said, take this and share it. Take this and share it. And so we need to have that perspective. We have the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And so we need to be good stewards of the truth that he's given us. We need to make sure that we're doing this not for ourselves, not with any bad motives, but we're doing this because we love God and we want to glorify him. We want God to be pleased with us, not people. And so one way that Paul highlights, one, one way that you can try and please people with evangelism, and now this is more focused on the person that you're actually talking to in the moment, one way that you can please people through evangelism is by using words of flattery. Verse 5, he says, For we never came with words of flatter, right? as you know, nor were the pretext for greed. God is a witness. So here's point number five. Avoid flattery. Now this, this goes for all the time, not just in evangelism. We need to avoid being flatterers. And, and what that means is using excessive and insincere praise to further your own agenda. Right? You, you come up to someone and you're flattering them. You're giving them praise. They're, you're the best. You're the greatest. You're the best. And you don't actually mean what you're saying. You just want to get in good graces with that person. That's called flattery. And that should be avoided all the time. We should never be flatterers. And then we think about in these opportunities that we have to share the gospel, we should not be flattering. So Paul is clear. Paul was not out to get rich and famous like we said. He wasn't out there smooth-talking people because he wanted an audience. He wasn't out there telling people, oh, you're the best and you're the greatest and you're so good and like, oh yeah, you're just one of the nicest people I've ever met. And like, oh, he wasn't out there flattering. Like, People didn't necessarily feel good all the time when Paul was talking. I mean, we've read the, the Bible. You've read his letters, right? The people he was writing to. It's, it's not like every single person Paul spoke to. He didn't, the goal wasn't, I'm going to make this person feel really good about themselves. I'm going to make this person feel good so that they can they'll listen to me, what I have to say. Flattery wasn't his goal. His goal was, I'm just going to share the gospel. I'm going to share the gospel. All right, so in evangelism, it can be tempting to use flattery. Or maybe you can, you're tempted to give some kind of praise, some kind of insincere praise to this person because you're just really hoping that it'll, it'll, it'll give you another minute or two with them. 
Or maybe you're, I mean, it could be anything. Oh, yeah, you're so smart. Oh, I can tell you're not like the average person. Like, oh, whatever it might be. We can't use flattery, ever. We can't use flattery when it comes to these opportunities to share the gospel. Right? We've got to stop trying to tickle their ears, is how the Bible describes it. We've got to just tell them the truth. And the truth is, look, I'm telling you this because I love you. And this is what you need to do. You need to repent of your sin. You need to put your trust in Jesus. You don't have to build the, you know, butter the person up and make all these kinds of different flattery, flattering statements. We, just, we need to avoid that. Avoid flattery. And so Paul, he says that we've avoided flattery. We, we're not in it for ourselves. We're in it because we're trying to please God. Like, this is why we're doing this. And then he says that they, they never sought glory from people during these mission trips. They never sought glory from people when they were planting churches. They never once were thinking that, that they would like to get some audience and they want people to think something great about them. That was not their focus. He says in verse 6, Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. So here's point number 6. Never seek personal recognition. Never seek any kind of personal recognition. Never be seeking personal glory when it comes to evangelism. So you should never be having a conversation with someone about the gospel and think to yourself, I'm going to try and say some really smart stuff. I want this person to really know that I've got my stuff figured out. I want people on this campus to know who I am. I'm the guy or the girl that, that really knows the Bible in and out, and, and I know all the apologetic stuff, and I want people to know me that way, and I want this, I want that. That's all about you, you understand? And the focus should not be about you. The focus is about the person that you're talking with about the gospel, and then glorifying God. So the aim, the goal, should never, ever be some kind of personal recognition. Maybe you've had the desire to be the person who can answer any question or who can win any argument. We don't evangelize for the sake of the argument. In fact, we, we shouldn't be arguing in the way that that word is used. We should be presenting the gospel because we love, for, we love these people. We're not in it for ourselves. And so this gets back down to checking your motives. Is, 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 there any, is there any prideful motive going on when it comes to evangelism? Do you want people to see you a certain way as this great evangelizer? Do you want people to see you this way? If that's the case, then your motives are wrong and you're in it for the wrong reasons because you're looking for personal recognition. Nobody needs to be thinking when they're evangelizing that they are going to be the next Ray Comfort, okay? Okay. Now, he's really awesome. It's helpful to watch his videos, to learn things, right? But that shouldn't be our motives. I'm going to be the next Ray Comfort. It shouldn't be it. You need to make sure that it never becomes about yourself. All right, so verse 7, he says, We were gentle among you. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. That's a helpful illustration. Think about how gentle a nursing mother is with her infant child. He's saying, that's how gentle we were among you guys in Thessalonica. So it was, it was Paul's habit to be gentle in his conversations, in his opportunities. So here's point number seven. Always speak gently. Speak gently. No one enjoys getting yelled at, unless you're like an athlete, and you're, whatever, in that context. But some kind of, in, in an evangelistic context, nobody enjoys getting yelled at by the person who's professing to be a Christian and saying, I love all people, and you're just yelling at me because you're telling me that I'm wrong. No one enjoys that. That is not a helpful thing to do. So if you find yourself in evangelistic opportunities and, and you are arguing and arguing and arguing and you're getting, you're getting red in the face and you're, and you're not being gentle, you're wrong. God's Word says that we have to be gentle in our evangelism, speaking gently. It's foolish to take a harsh approach to evangelism. Like, if you want the door slammed right in your face, then be harsh. If you never want another opportunity to talk to that person again about the gospel, then be harsh. But if you want more opportunity, if you want to build some relationship with that person, which is, which is part of the goal as well, be gentle. 
Be gentle. Now, that doesn't mean that you dance around the truth. You tell them the truth, and the truth is that they're a sinner before a holy God, and if they don't put their trust in Jesus, then they will experience the, the eternal torment. They'll experience hell. They, like, we tell them the truth, but we don't have to get red-faced and yell at people. We just talk about it, and we're gentle, and we're loving. I mean, look, speaking of Ray Comfort, look, that guy is very skilled at this, okay? Let's think about this. He can de-escalate a crazy situation super fast. If you've never watched his videos, just go on YouTube, look up Ray Comfort, Living Waters. It's really helpful. Dude is very gifted with evangelism. But I've never seen someone be so gentle, but also tell people that they are a lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer at heart, right? That's what he's telling these people. Let's walk through the Ten Commandments. Have you done this? Yeah. Have you done this? Yeah. 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 I've done this. Okay. So here's what you're telling me. You, you, you just admitted yourself. You are a lying, thieving, adulterous, murder at heart. But he doesn't yell, right? And even in the cases where the guy is louder, right? He does the things where he stands up on a box and there's other people and they stand up and like there, there draws a crowd and he's got to raise his voice so people can hear. But even that is done in a gentle manner, right? He's not like just coming down and, and, and yelling in red face. He's, he's got a gentle approach. Anyways, I guess that's a plug for Ray Comfort, but it's helpful, right? So the, you just need, you need, to, you need to be patient. We need to have patience, in our evangelism. Never get frustrated with people. Even when people are just not getting it. I, I, I get it, right? People sometimes just put words in your mouth and they don't understand and they're saying, oh, you're saying this and you're being hateful. And like, We're not being hateful. But don't get upset. Don't get mad. Don't speak harshly. Be gentle. Be patient. Even if you are spoken harshly to, don't return that. Don't return evil for evil. If someone gets in your face and, and whatever, you just say, okay, well, just de-escalate and be gentle. And at some point in time, it's wise to walk away. Like, you don't have to make a stand and it, 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 there's, there's no, you just walk away. But do it gently. You can disagree with a gentle tone as well. You can tell someone that you think that they're wrong in a gentle tone. We've got to be gentle. This is how Paul conducted himself and we should follow suit. Verse 8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. So what Paul is essentially saying to the Thessalonians is that he loved them very much. He had just met them. He just arrived in that city. And just meeting these people. But he was affectionately desirous of them. He loved them very much. He had a love for them that said, I love these people. I've just met these people, but I love these people. And because I love them as much as I do, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to share the gospel with every last one of them. Because I love these people. He loved them and he had a longing for them to trust in Christ. He longed. He had this desire. You can just picture him just pleading with people and, and praying earnestly with God over and over, multiple times a day. God, please give me opportunity. Please give me opportunity. God, please, I just met this person. God, please change their heart. Please save them. He did this because of how much he loved these people. And not, not only was he ready to share the gospel, he says he was ready to share his entire life with these people. He just met them. And he says, I'll share my whole life with you. I'll share all the time, all the time I have, I'll sit with you. Whatever, whatever material, whatever resources I have at my disposal, I'll help you. I'm, I'm going to be there with you. I'm ready to share my life with you. I'm ready to share my time, my mind, my, my, my body, who I, I'm ready to share with you. And it says that over the course of time, he says that they became very dear to Paul. Think about the people in your life that you hold that are, that are very dear to you. He's writing to these people and he's saying, here's what happened. I was affectionately desirous of you and you became very dear to me. Here's point number eight. Pray to love non-Christians more. We need to be able to say the same thing 
about the lost people around us, that we are affectionately desirous of them, that they are very dear to us, that we are ready to share the gospel and ourselves with them, that we're ready to walk through life with them and point them to Christ every second of every day. We are ready to do this because of how much we love them. We should be willing to patiently explain the gospel over and over and over again until they understand, until they respond appropriately. We should be willing to do the hard work of evangelism because we love them. We think about evangelism, what do we think? Oh, that's scary. I'm not good at it. I can't do that. I clam up and I get nervous. Yes, all of that is true. It is a difficult thing. I'm just being honest. It is a hard thing, right? But what should overcome that is the love that we have because we don't want people to go to hell. We want people to have a right relationship with God. And we love people so much that we're willing to look past all the difficulties, all the possible ridicule. We're willing to look past all these things and say, I just love these people. So I'm going to share the gospel with them. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be praying that God would give us a greater, more intense love for non-Christians. As we're praying for these opportunities, praying God... Help me to love them more than I do. Help me to love these people more than I do. It takes prayer to cultivate this more. Verses 9 and 10, he says, For you remember, brothers, about our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. So Paul He worked day and night as a tent maker to earn money to provide for himself as he was doing these missionary journeys. He didn't ask these Christians for money. He didn't proclaim the gospel and people get saved and then say, hey, can I get some money? He didn't do that. He could have, and it would have been okay. But he said, I'm not going to do that because I I don't want to be a burden to any of you. And in moving forward, he says, I conducted myself in a holy way. All of his conduct, all his behavior, all his words, his goal was to be righteous and to be holy and to not do anything or say anything that would make him a stumbling block for these people. No, he was not perfect. He's not perfect. Silas and Timothy, they're not perfect. But it was a priority of Paul's to keep from living contradictory to the message that he was proclaiming. You understand how bad it would be for any of us to be going out there and proclaiming the gospel and calling people to repent of their sin and put their trust in Jesus, yet those people that we're talking to see us on Friday nights and see the ungodly things that we're doing, that's a disaster. That's not right. And so Paul is saying, I conducted myself in, in a manner of, of holiness. So here's point nine. I don't know if I said this yet. So many. I'm sorry. Point nine. Maintain righteous conduct. This is not just during the act of evangelism. This is your whole life. So specifically, yes, when you are talking to someone about the gospel, you need to watch yourself, watch your tone, make sure you're being gentle, make sure that you're loving them. Don't say anything that's contradictory to what the Bible teaches. That's important. But then, the way that you're living your life every day needs to be holy and pure. Your lifestyle needs to match what you profess. Because if it doesn't, that's going to hurt your witness. And if it doesn't, you should be concerned for yourself. Because the Bible is very clear about what the conduct of a Christian is going to look like. Verse 11, he says, For you know how, like a father with his children, verse 12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Here's point number 10. Emphasize personal holiness. Got to make sure that whenever we are proclaiming the gospel, especially when someone repents and believes, we've got to emphasize, now here's what God wants you to do. Here's what the Bible says you need to do. You need to pursue holiness. You need to walk in a way 
in a manner that is worthy of God. And look, if your lifestyle isn't matching with this, how in the world are you going to call someone to live this way? How are you going to tell someone that they have to live in a way that aligns with God's word if you're not doing it? So you've got to check yourself. How are you living? Because if you're not living in the way that God's word describes, it's going to hurt your witness and you will be pretty hypocritical when you're calling other people to repent with their trust in Jesus and then to live in holiness if you're not doing the same thing, if it's not important to you. So look, these are ten things that we need to be thinking about and praying about when it comes to evangelism. Um, I know that this can seem overwhelming, of course, but look, look, we need to add all of these things to our prayer list. And we should be saying, God, help me to do this. Help me to follow this example. This is the example that your word sets for evangelism. So help me to do this. Help me to live this out. And as we are making it a point to pray for God to help us in these areas, he will. And it's just going to make us better with our evangelism. It's gonna, he's going to give us the boldness to actually be sharing the gospel and to have fruitful opportunities. So let's pray, and then we will go to small groups. God, thank you for the example that we have in your word that Paul and his company set for us to follow. I pray that we can take these principles from your word. We can live them out. God, please help us to be people who love others, who, who are affectionately desirous of the lost people around us. God, help us to have um, beneficial conversation in small group now as we discuss what we just talked about. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.